morning, Joster. Well, our vlog for today will start here. Today we are going on the dearly departed Helter Skelter tour. Who's ready for this? Uh, to give you a bit of an idea of the time period, three weeks prior to the Tate LaBianca murders, the first man walked on the moon. A couple of weeks prior to that, Judy Garland died in London, prompting her funeral in New York and the Stonewall riots kicked off at that moment. The whole gay rights movement kicked off at that moment. At the same time, we had going, uh, Nixon began his withdrawal from Vietnam in 69. The Smothers Brothers on television were canceled, but Scooby-Doo debuted, as did Room 222 in Love American Style. Women's Liberation, the Sexual Revolution, the Generation Gap, and Civil Rights. Civil Rights are always a hot issue, but at that time, there was an organization on the scene called the Black Panthers. And the Black Panthers weren't necessarily bad people, but they were an armed group, a uniformed group of pissed off black people that were tired of being treated like second class citizens, especially by law enforcement, and they were doing something about it. So, uh, and America had never seen anything like it before. On that very week, they were filming the first episode of The Brady Bunch on the Port Paramount Studios lot, which is where they took Roman Polanski when he returned from London. It's all these weird little pop culture references. They're zigzagging back and forth across each each other. Now, uh, on the very day, August 8th, 1969, just a few hours before the Tate murders in Benedict Canyon in, in London, the Beatles walked across Abbey Road and took their iconic Abbey Road album cover photograph, which I think is fascinating because they figure into this case. And also on that very day, just a bit of trivia, the Haunted Mansion opened in Disneyland on the very day the murders happened where the Barker Ranch was, where they were ultimately arrested because it's 200 miles from here, and uh, and also the Spawn Ranch where they were ultimately, where they were living at the time of the murders, that uh, that burned in 1970, and it's uh, 45 minutes in each direction to see this empty lot. So I'm gonna take you there by video, using pieces of video. There were also pieces of music, pieces of film clips that I didn't have the rights to use to in the documentary that I can use to show you today during the trial or during the uh, the tour. It's funny that such a silly song could become such a notorious expression. Manson's need to associate the Beatles music with the Bible would be so distorted that it would lead to several pointless murders and scare the living hell out of everyone on the planet at some point in time. Upon Charlie Manson's release from prison in 1967, he was let loose near the Haight-Ashbury district in San Francisco, Hippie Haven. When this case broke in December of 1969, it became even more fascinating. More murders were discovered, murder plots, Armageddon, it involved rock stars, Hollywood royalty, and hippies. You could not make this stuff up. Five persons, including actress Sharon Tate, were found dead at the home of Miss Tate and her husband, screen director Roman Polyansky. Miss Tate, who starred in Valley of the Dolls, was eight months pregnant and was found in a bikini-type nightgown with a rope around her neck attached to the body of a man. Two discovered this morning by a maid who ran screaming to neighbors. One officer summed up the murders when he said, in all my years, I have never seen anything like this before. While the police admitted they had no suspects in the Bel Air massacre, there were two more murders 15 miles away in the Silver Lake section of Los Angeles. The similarities, they do not believe the crimes are linked. The detectives screwed up spectacularly on this case from the very moment it happened. Since the murders were one night after the other, nobody knew they were related at that point. They assigned a different team of detectives, one to each of the crimes. Those investigating the LaBianca crimes reached out to those investigating the Tate crimes, noting the similarities, multiple stab wounds, mutilation, words in blood on the walls, including the word pig at both locations. Because of the social makeup of the victims at the Tate crime scene, they were younger, they were hippies, they were swingers, quote unquote, there were some drugs found at the scene, not a whole lot. Two of the victims, Wojciech Fakowski and Abigail Folger, have both done the drug MDA earlier in the day. And one of the victims of Wojciech Fakowski had known drug connections. Whereas at the La Bianca crime scene, they just seemed like a middle-aged couple clearly not their middle age, uh, going about their business, fairly successful in business. Uh, they didn't seem like there was any way that these, that these two groups of people could possibly be related. So the detective at the Tate crime scene said, nah, we're looking at drugs for this one. Wouldn't even entertain the thought that they may be, uh, that they may be related. And also the team of detectives at the La Bianca crime scene, they were more seasoned detectives. They've been around a bit. And at the, uh, the guys at the La Bianca crime scene, they were, um, they were younger 
Center. There were hot shots. There were also a, a part of the Sirhan Sirhan Bobby Kennedy trial. And uh, and these older detectives were going, who are these kids coming after us telling us how to do our job? So there was a, an element of stubbornness involved too. Now the LaBiancas, uh, had both been married before. They both had children from other relationships, but they had no children together. I'm just as confused as I was 10 years ago researching this case because there's just so much information out there and so much weird information. And there was a time where I would have, I, most, a lot of the information that I have, people have told me, and I'm like, you're insane, that's stupid. And then a couple of years later, it's like, oh, it's actually legit. So uh, there's nothing I can dismiss anymore as crazy. 15 year old, he asked if he could stay an extra night. Their friends agreed to bring him home the next evening. That was a decision that saved Frank's life. So the lobby Broncos returned to Los Angeles, Lino behind the wheel of a 1968 green Thunderbird with the boat hitched up behind him and Susan LaBerge in the back and they dropped off Susan at her apartment, you're going to see in just a moment, at 4616 North Greenwood Place. Now Susan LaBerge lived here with her boyfriend, Joe Dorgan. Now Susan LaBerge, same age as the girls in the family, um, Tex Watson. Now. Tex Watson is the real monster here, not Charles Manson. Manson Manson has become the focal point of this case, but Tex Watson is the man who is pretty much responsible for the uh, for these brutal murders. He was he directly killed six of these seven people that were killed on those two nights. He killed them. Patricia Cranwinkle killed Abigail Folger, but otherwise the other six victims were all killed by Tex Watson. And Charles Manson was nowhere near the murders when they happened. So when they call Manson a serial killer, maybe he is a serial killer, but it's never been proven that Charles Manson has ever killed anyone in life. That's just a fact. Manson has never killed anyone. And we know he's tried to. We know he's tried to. So it's it's likely, but it's never been proven that Manson has killed anyone. Tex Watson is the killer here. Tex Watson is the monster here. Tex Watson worked in a thrift store. Mrs. LaBianca owned a thrift store. That might be a bit of a stretch. But after these, after these people were sentenced to die, uh, they were found guilty and sentenced to death. And the death penalty was overturned about a year and a half later, and they became eligible for parole. Doris Tate was behind that, Sharon's mother. She won the rights to go to these parole hearings. So when Tex Watson was on the other side of the table saying, let me out, please, I'd like to get out, Mrs. Tate could look him in the eye and say, yeah, and when am I coming up for parole? When's my baby coming up for parole? Susan LaBerge went to Tex Watson's parole hearing testifying for his release, saying, I forgive him for murdering my mother and my stepfather. She didn't go to Patricia Krenwinkel's, who took a, a piece of newspaper and dipped it in her stepfather's blood and wrote words on the wall. She didn't go to Leslie Van Houten's, who stabbed her mother Six time, 16 times after she was already dead, but she went to Tex Watson, the monster that killed those two people, directly killed those two people, and said, I forgive him for murdering my mother and my stepfather. Here's a nice picture of Tex and Susan in prison. Tex Watson's the crazy one here. The reason Manson is the focal point of all this is because they needed something to weave it all together. And Helter Skelter was the thing that they used, this war between the blacks and the whites. This, this is the building that they used in for Melrose Place. Oh. Doesn't look like it. It's it. <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. LaBianca, the, the address on her driver's license is Disney's old house. She used to live in it. This is where Tex used to live. This is just uh, this part portion of this apartment building stands where Tex's apartment used to be. So you can see how close in proximity they were. It was printed that she was worth $2 million. That's just not true. I don't know where that came from. Somebody said it was a typo. You can't typo $2 million and $70,000. I don't know where that came from. <clears throat> but the problem with that is that it left a lot of speculation. It left a, it left a lot of a lot of thought into possible motivation for this crime. But Mrs. LaBianca was worth, I got the probate files a couple of months ago myself, 60,000, or six, between 60 and $70,000. So she wasn't ridiculously rich like it was implied in the book Helter Skelter, which opens up a conversation as to motive. Now, Mr. LaBianca had 10% ownership of the Gateway supermarkets, of which there were nine. His mother was the majority stock owner. Mr. LaBianca had been embezzling from the company. He was paying her back about $10,000 a year. Mr. LaBianca was $200,000 in debt at the time of the murders with gambling debts, horse racing. That was his thing. His family didn't even know he owned racehorses when he died. So they originally, the detectives thought it might have been a loan shark thing. Now, after they dropped off Susan at her apartment, 
<clears throat> they stopped and bought a newspaper. Across the street, far right corner where that bank is now, is where this gas station used to be up until a few years ago. On the corner where that gas station was, was a newsstand. And the man that operated that newsstand was named, his name was John Focianos. Now, he knew Mr. LaBianca because whenever Mr. LaBianca worked late, he always bought a newspaper on his way home because they were selling the next day's paper because it was after midnight and he was getting the racing form so he could bet on the horses. The newspaper that Mr. Focchiano sold him that night was this one. Sharon Tate, four others murdered. Because they'd been on the road all day. They had not heard about the Tate murders, so this was the first they'd heard of it. And it's quite shocking, really, because it seems so very random. And when you say something like ritualistic slangs, that's scary. Adding to that that Roman Polanski did Rosemary's Baby, Sharon did a movie called Eye of the Devil, the two of them did a movie called uh, uh, The Fearless Vampire Killers, um, you know, uh, complimenting this whole theory being the you know, the words and blood on the walls and the mutilation. One time they got home and the dog was out. That's all that was different. The dog was out. They knew the dog was in when they got home. When they got home, the dog was outside. So that was really disturbing to them. There's a, there's a letter that she wrote to a relative of her saying, it happened again the other day. Well, we come to find out that the mansion and the family used to hang out in the house next door to the La Biancas. A buddy of Manson's rented the house next door. A mansion had been there several times. So had Susan Atkins and so had most of the other ones. So, and Manson and the family did these little exercises called creepy crawl where they would let themselves into people's houses and steal things or rearrange things while you were sleeping. The LaBiancas were quite shaken up by this because someone had been in their house a couple of times over the past year. So hearing about these, these random crimes, uh, it, was, it was quite disturbing. And as I said, they were on the road all day, so this is the first they had heard of it. And uh, now keep in mind, back then, we got news twice a day. We got it at 6 and 11 and a daily newspaper. So this was scary as hell because up until this night, you thought you were safe in your own bed and you weren't anymore. Abigail Folger was in bed in a nightgown reading a book and within 20 minutes it was on the front lawn of the house with 28 stab wounds. So this changed everything. You were no longer safe in bed. And we also keep in mind, you know, as I said, we got news twice a day back then. So it left a lot of time for people's imaginations. This changed and it went unsolved for months. So uh, so it changed, it changed things. It changed the way people thought. It changed personal comfort and safety. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I was a little boy growing up in Detroit. I don't remember the tr I don't remember the murders, but I remember when the trial happened, and I remember when those killers became eligible for parole when they had tossed out the death penalty. And I thought Manson, they made the way they made the way they portrayed Manson is he's going to come crawling up the side of my house with his crazy eyes and crawl on my windows and kill me. You know that was that was that was the way he was portrayed. Now Manson, <clears throat> as I mentioned, he recorded a lot of music, and there's one song that he has makes reference to the children with the X's in their heads. Now at the beginning. Beginning of the trial, Manson wanted to represent himself. This is the Spawn Ranch where they were living, actually. The ranch was built for westerns. It was a fake little town. If you wanted to show a cowboy trotting down in a little town, an, un, a nondescript town, they use a spawn ranch. There's, there was there was dozens of them out there in Simi Valley at that time. They were just empty. They were just empty rooms. So if you look like you're passing a saloon, if you looked inside the door, there's nothing in there. And Manson and the family were kicked out of where they were and needed a place to stay. And somebody in the family knew somebody who knew George Spawn and introduced Charlie to George Spawn. Charlie was a likable guy, and so was George. And Charlie said, "Do you mind if we stay in these empty rooms?" rooms for a couple of days and George agreed. Then Charlie assigned all the girls to wait on George, hand and foot. So Squeaky was one on one, Lynette Fromm to George. Squeaky kept him happy all the time. They say the nickname Squeaky came from the noise she made when George ran his hand up her thigh. Manson had those girls cleaning his house, cooking three square meals for him a day, making sure he wanted for nothing. So George was in no rush to get rid of these people. He was living the high life. Lee Van Houten explaining who was in the car with him when they left the ranch. Charlie will tell you what he said to Mr. LaBianca when he tied him up and left him in the house. And then Leslie will tell you what they did to them in vivid detail. We got in the car. It was uh, Steve and Tex and Manson and Linda Kasabian, Susan, Patton, and I. And Manson and Tex got out and went up. And I seen uh, a guy sitting on the couch. And I laughed at him. He said, hi. I said, hi. He texted me, man. Benson gave Tex Watson leather laces from around his neck to tie up Lino LaBianca. Then Manson left without leaving any fingerprints. I told the other dudes, I'll see you later, man. You know, like, I'll catch it on the run, man. I'm gone, man. And I split. 
Manson came back, and I believe texted too, and he pointed at Pat and I and told us to get out and go do what Tex said. He said to Tex to make sure that everybody did something. Did uh, Charlie tell you specifically what form of mutilation he wanted? Yeah, he wanted, he wanted us to like, squish eyeballs on the walls and stuff like that. So the LaBianca house is the next one coming up on the left. So that night, Mr. LaBianca was behind the wheel of the car with the boat hitched up behind him. They came up the street in front of us, came up and parked immediately to our left. You see the swoop of the wall? You can see in this photograph right there. This is where they found the car and the boat the very next morning, right here. So an overhead view of the property shows this long driveway, and there at the bottom of the driveway, there's that boat, and there's the Thunderbird right there. Now, the front of the property has changed incredibly. The house and the driveway are still there, but almost invisible. So, as the house is set up geographically, that large picture window, that's the living room where Mr. LaBianca was murdered. Uh, his body was found about seven feet straight back from the window. Mrs. LaBianca was killed in the master bedroom, which is that peaked roof that you could barely see over the hedges on the left side of the house. And this is what happened up there. And so we went into the house. How many people were in the house? Two, a man and a woman. And were they tied up? Yes, they were very frightened. Tex said to get knives, and Pat and I took Mrs. LaBianca into the bedroom. I had Mrs. LaBianca lay down on the bed. I don't remember putting the pillowcase over her head, but I'm sure that I did. Wrapped a um, lamp cord around her, and she began struggling, and she heard her husband dying in the living room. When Mrs. LaBianca heard him dying, she came forward, and I was trying to hold her down, and Pat attempted to stab her. She hit the collarbone and the knife bent, and I went out of the room, and I called for Tex. Um, Tex came into the room, and he killed her. Now, this house next door on our left used to be rented by a man named Harold True. And we know Manson spent at least three nights in this house. So did Tex Watts. I mean, this was a party house. There are, there are police documents noting that this was a nuisance home in the neighborhood. And... Harold True was a bit of a nuisance person. So this is a place where hippies would quote unquote gravitate, or say hippies, yeah, they were hippies, uh, used to gravitate towards. And, uh, you know, there were probably a lot of drugs at the party too, and a lot of undesirable people. We know Manson was here too. Dozier, who was the producer of the TV show Batman. And according to legend, Dozier was in J.C. Brinks' barber chair and said, we're considering doing a spin-off of Batman, but we need someone who's Asian who can act and do karate. Well, J.C. Brink and Sharon Tate were dating while they made the record crew they both took karate lessons from Bruce Lee and he said you should meet my karate teacher Bruce Lee and Bruce Lee was cast as Kato from the Green Hornet because of Jay Sebring. Adults liked it because it was ridiculously campy over the top you could see villains like Tallulah Bankhead and Deliverace. I mean these are these are legends you know show business Van Heflin Academy Award winning golden age of Hollywood actors playing these silly over the top villains and there were a lot of inside jokes in Batman too and in one episode British pop stars Chad and Jeremy were visiting Gotham City and Catwoman stole their voices and held them for ransom. And if ransom wasn't paid, she's going to take everyone's voice in the whole wide world. Catwoman's hideout in that episode was behind Mr. Oceanbring's salon. J.C. Bring is in an episode of Batman as Mr. Oceanbring. Still forever. <laughs> most men's hairstylists at the time. There were a couple of guys, but El Sassoon was one of them as well. But Jay was the number one guy. And he had a salon that opened in April of 1969 up in San Francisco, but the headquarters of Sebring International were at 725 North Fairfax, just here on our left. Where you see that open blue door? That open blue door went to Jay's private salon on the second floor. The pink door on the right with that large picture window, that was the men's salon. And the women's was there where that person is standing with the dog now with the stripy awning behind the tree. That's the women's salon. It's still a salon today, good form. It still uses some of Jay's sinks in there that Jay had uh, back when he was open. 
Here's a photograph of Jay and his staff in front of this building. This part is where that window's cut out now with that sort of like chandelier there. Tarantino put Sebring Salon back. Here's some photographs of it when they started doing it. So here's them putting the wood facade on it. They completely replaced it all. And that was Sebring Salon with the doors and even Jay's Porsche parked in front of it. And the coolest thing is that when you walk up to the Porsche, the dry cleaning had Jay's name on it inside the Porsche. That's the weird details that they went into. All the cars in the lot, all the way to the very last car was from the from the 60s or earlier. And they went so far as to take all the magazines out of these stands and put 1969 magazines in newspapers in these stands. Fake uh, you know, pieces of paper. I mean, they were legit newspapers from back then. I'll show you a couple of pictures. They did work on the movie with them and, uh, and uh, some friends of mine. Oh, here's Jay and Sharon together. They were together for a year before she met Roman Polanski, but most people agree that uh, Sharon, or Jay was certainly the love of Sharon's, sorry, Sharon was the love of Jay's life. Most everyone who met Jay maintained a friendship with Jay after they broke up, including Sharon's own parents. Sharon's mom took lessons in the Sebring method of cutting hair and opened up her own salon at Rancho Palos Verdes called Tate's hair designs. This is her, uh, Doris and her youngest daughter, Patty Tate, who's now passed away. Boy, it's shaking, isn't it? It's the old J. Sebring estate. And, you know, everything that's on this tour is still a work in progress. Even though it's been 13 years I've been doing this tour, I've been studying this case for 20-something, and it's everything, it's just constantly being updated, and constantly with more information, and it gets constantly more bizarre. But, but anyway, we're here, we're here to celebrate these people, the nine people, the seven Tate LaBianca victims, Gary Hinman and Shorty Shea. They're all sort of the fallout of this insane event that happened in 69. But, so the anniversary is coming up in August, August uh, uh, 8th and 9th. It's the night of. And on the 9th, that day, we're doing a 60s thing of L.A. We're doing the El Coyote thing on the 8th at night. But on the 9th, we're doing like a, just a 60s lighthearted day. It's not going to be about the murders. It's going to be about the 60s in L.A. and Tarantino, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. So we're doing a, a bus tour of 60s L.A., whiskey and go-go kind of stuff. And also that night, we're doing a cocktail party, a Valley of the Dolls cocktail party at Raleigh Studios. Oh, so very cool. Be costumes. There could be special guests. And it's How do people go? Do they sign up somewhere, yeah, buy yeah, tickets, or where? Go to uh, DoolyDepartedTours.com and you'll see you'll see all the information about there. Or drop me an email, Scott at Dooley Departed Tours, and uh, and you'll uh, you'll you can learn all about it and get tickets if you want. But it's gonna be a lot of fun, and uh, it's all about remembering the victims, one way or the other. We and you you did a little bit more than that because you were actually a consultant on the movie the Tarantino movie, which is really cool that they'll have somebody with some real expertise or real knowledge and interest in the story that's not just regurgitating things they've read, you know, in one book. You've been reading and studying this for your entire life, pretty much. Yeah, he's like, he, what I really, he and I got along really well because he's into the pop culture 60s stuff and so am I. So we hit it off and when it came to the murders and stuff and, and how it touched on so many different facets of, of the 60s, television and movies and music, you know, it, it, we got on really, really well in that regard and I'm, and I'm thrilled to be just because, I don't know, there's a little bit of me out there which is kind of cool. That is awesome. Congratulations, and if I'm around, I'll definitely be in, uh, you know, interested in doing some of the uh, festivities. I hope so. I so. Hope you do. It'd be great, Jordan. We'd love to have you there. Thanks again, buddy.